opportunity to live in a place where there was the opportunity to go to high school or college or in our tribe we're liberal we're conservative we're everything in between some of us prefer worship that burns calories and some of us just want to sit there in the corner and don't anybody look at me I'm happy right here don't touch me don't talk to me right some of us would like to have a fiery emotional service and some of us want to sit and just take notes in their Bible or read quietly or look at their phones. Some of us are worshiping here in this room and some of us are worshiping at home, sitting on their couch or maybe in their kitchen looking at their iPads or their phones or their computers or their tablets. If Nazarenes ceased to exist, the exodus, the people going out would spread out in all directions because we are truly a mixed bag and I love it that way I wouldn't have it any other way because our tribe is everywhere we're in over 600 nations around the world so when we think about being a Christian it isn't just an American Christian because we belong to people who who don't even speak our language or would wonder why we do the things we do but we're all family have you ever thought about it that way? Okay, you're all asleep. Is it because you're wearing masks that you can't respond to me? Okay, I'm glad you're out there. Okay, good. All right. But you've heard me say it before, and I will say it again. We are countercultural. That means Christians, believers, not just Nazarenes, don't march to the beat of the government. We listen. 
<laughs> we listen to a different drummer, right? Our tribe was begun uh, almost 100, well, 125 years ago, in 1895. Officially, I know, somebody's going to come up afterwards and say it was 1908 in Pilot Point, Texas. I know that. But in 1895, a man with a funny name, Phineas Brzee, started a church outside in downtown Los Angeles in an inner city. And the reason he did that was, hear me clearly, you're going to go, what? <laughs> the reason he started it there was because he was a Methodist pastor and the bishop took his church away from him because he said, I don't think people should have to pay for their pews. Now, how would you like to have to pay a tax to sit in the pew where you are right now? He said, I think people should be able to sit anywhere they want to in the sanctuary. And the bishop said, mm, I think you're done here. So he started his own church because he wanted a church where people could come and be comfortable if they didn't fit anywhere else. That's who we are. Did you know that? And one of the things that our church did, and I'm going to be stepping on a few toes here, and I don't care because this is who we are. One of the things that our church did was create a safe place for people who did not drink alcohol. Now, it was started before the time of prohibition, but the church decided or observed that alcohol could cause a problem. And I'm only picking on this one thing to, to give an illustration, all right? That alcohol was breaking down families. Now remember our church was started to provide a safe place for people who didn't fit anywhere else. And some of those people who didn't fit anywhere else were broken families. Because at that time the acceptable churches were pretty much middle class white churches where you had to you know, pay a tax for your pew and um, where you had to have two parents and normal looking children, which means they had their shoes on. Mm -hmm. So we were a place to provide safety for those who said, I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. That's who our tribe is. So for over 100 years, almost 125 years now, the culture around us welcomed us, championed us, said, yay you. We don't necessarily want to be part of you, but yay what you're doing, all right? As the healers of human brokenness. But, but that's changing. Tell somebody out loud now in a public place that you're a Christian and what are you going to hear? What that can mean to those people within hearing can run a whole gamut of things. We're now being viewed as a threat. Dr. Boone, who's the president of Trebekah University, Trebekah Nazarene University, right, Jordan? Mm -hmm. Trebekah. Has heard us described, and this is a quote, as radicals, bigots, extremists, deniers of human rights, and mean-spirited, because some of us are. What I don't hear is, oh, so you are a follower of Jesus. A famous quote by an influential world changer, Mahatma Gandhi, who literally changed an entire subcontinent of Asia by nonviolent means, by living the principles that we say are Christian principles. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now this was an observation. We can argue with what he said, but we can't argue with what he saw and what he believed. So what has happened to the Christian worldview, to, to how we are viewed by the rest of the world? Because of when and where we live in the prevailing culture, we have tried to advance our mission through political action and we've declared ourselves to be in a culture war. We, we go to court, we make court actions and executive orders to align what we believe our culture's direction with ours. That was never supposed to be the goal of believers. 
Okay, in case some of you are confused right now, I'll restate that. As Christians, we are tempted to want to make the government look and sound like us. That was never the goal of the church. Whenever I become bewildered, I look to my source and try to imagine what Jesus would do. I read my Bible, I pray, I look at the scenes and say, okay, if this was happening to Jesus right now, what would God's response be in this situation? Guess what? Jesus was pretty much apolitical. He took no part in politics. He wasn't registered in any party. And he didn't even try to overthrow the government. That might have been part of the problem that got him martyred. So he understood that he was living under an oppressive government that did not see the image of God in its citizens. The Roman government was not a kind and gentle government. It did not view people as bearing the image of God, which is what we believe, isn't it? But his desire was not to overthrow that government or make it to conform to the righteousness of God. He almost completely ignored the government, actually. Jesus' desire was to subvert it, to change it from the inside out, from the bottom up, one on one, by living in such a way that lives are changed and God is glorified. In fact, the only time that we see Jesus angry in Scripture is mostly in response to the religious leaders. Ouch. We can be either submissive or defensive when we react to the culture around us. The danger of living on the defensive, of feeling defensive, of feeling angry, is that we can become belligerent. If we think of ourselves as constantly being threatened by somebody else, we can very easily start to think of other people as our enemies and feel anger towards them. The church has always had such angry people writing their tracts and pe preaching their sermons against an unfriendly world. And the world is unfriendly, and there are things that we do need to preach against. Hear me clearly. But is that the best way to counteract the culture? The author of the scripture we're reading this morning, Peter, he's the one who hung out with Jesus so much and made so many glaring mistakes. I, I identify with him. Peter, you know, always putting your foot in your mouth and stumbling over it, making mistakes. Peter's somebody we can identify with. He's the one who wrote the, the letter we're going to be talking about for a couple of weeks. He went through this too. He had problems. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, when he was arrested, when soldiers, soldiers came to march Jesus away, Peter became overwhelmed by the odds against him, and he was angry at the injustice of it all, and he grabbed a sword and cut off somebody's ear. But Jesus said, no, that's not the way we're going to deal with things. And he healed that man. And so Peter, he learned his lesson, and then he wrote in this letter, in chapter 3 of 1 Peter, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are and always... Did I say that right? I'm going to read it again. I don't know if I was hearing myself wrong or if I read it wrong. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are. I left out a phrase. You're going to have to look it up in your scriptures. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may, may be put to shame. Thank you, sister. Okay, now you know I'm not perfect. <laughs> I know, laughter. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's a good scripture. Okay, write that down and look it up when you get home. Read it. <laughs> Peter, the man who wrote the scripture we're going to be thinking about for the next few weeks. But 
The important part I want you to catch is always be ready, know what to say, and do it how? Yeah, gentleness and respect or with utmost courtesy. We don't need to shout at people. We don't need to argue with them. We don't need to have a list of rules. They're helpful for us to know what we believe. But how do we respond to people? How do we interact with people? As a friend. Okay, Peter. These two short letters that Peter wrote are for the people of God. Okay, this is important. The people of God who have been... They were really in exile. They had been booted out of their cities, their homes, the places where they grew up and knew. They were true exiles. They were gone. And he wrote this letter to them because they were living a difficult, difficult thing. Okay, if we had to leave Chandler, we could find another church someplace to worship, couldn't we? We could find another Safeway or Fries or Bashes to buy our groceries at, couldn't we? We could find another school to put our children into, couldn't we? If we were exiled because of what we believed, the way we looked, the God we worshiped, None of those things would be available to us. These are the people that Peter is writing to right now. They are hurting. They have seen a miracle or heard about a miracle and believed in something unbelievable. And because of that, they've been exiled. And now he's helping them understand the hurt that they're feeling and what to do with it. That's why this is such a powerful letter for us to read and to meditate on and to think about and to pray about and to live. These people had been called by love to worship God and then been scattered far and wide to become the church of God globally. I see a pattern here. They are strangers, aliens, misfits, persecuted. In this book, I want you to open it right now, whether it's on your phone or in the Bible that you brought with us. I'm sorry the pew Bibles aren't there because, you know, we can't touch things anymore. Um, but there's a list I'm going to be reading to you of verses that tell us who we are, that give us our identity in Christ. In this love letter that Peter wrote, 1 Peter, we are identified as strangers, strangers and aliens. And we like to think of ourselves as large and in charge, right? I do. But more than being just strangers, we are chosen strangers. In this love letter, there are clues to our identities, and in chapter 1, verse 4, we read, we have a pure and enduring inheritance. That means it won't fade away. And nobody can steal our identity and wipe it out of the bank. It's there. It's ours. In chapter 1, verse 15, we are called to live lives of holiness. And in verse 20, we are chosen by Christ. And in verse 22, we are set apart so that we might have genuine affection for each other, loving deeply. Chapter 2, verse 4, rejected by humans, we are still valued by God. Verse 5, as living stones, we are built into a spiritual temple. You are the church. Verse 9, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession. Verse 10, once not a people, now we are God's people. Verse 11, we are immigrants and strangers. There we are again, strangers. Verse 16, we are God's slaves, yet free people. Oh, I could preach a sermon on each of those verses. Don't worry. This is powerful stuff, people. This is who you are. This is our identity as believers in God. So even though we find ourselves in exile, we are family. We suffer together. We love together. 
Peter connects the suffering of Christ to their suffering, to the people he's writing to, to our suffering. Their suffering belongs to the suffering of Jesus that makes them characters in the same story. That's how we're all family. And they are called to rejoice in their suffering. I don't know how easy that is for you. I don't find it easy at all to be happy, to rejoice when I'm suffering loss or grief or heartache or anxiety. He, don't, he wants us to rejoice though rather than whine or be surprised by the suffering we might encounter. In chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 we read, You now rejoice in this hope even if it's necessary for you to be distressed for a short time by various trials. This is necessary. Oh, I don't want to believe that. This is necessary so that your faith may be found genuine. Your faith is more valuable than gold, which will be destroyed, even though it is itself tested by fire. Dr. Dan Boone wrote a book that I have read and heartily endorsed entitled A Charitable Discourse, talking about the things that divide us. Discourse is a conversation, a back and forth. You say something, I say something, and we listen to each other very carefully. That's what this book is all about. He says, we have a hard time doing that when people disagree with us, don't we? I want to believe that if I can make you change your mind, and we both believe the same thing, then we're okay. Dr. Boone says, and he's actually quoting Jesus, that just because you disagree doesn't mean you can't still get along. And that's what this book is all about. Other theologians have called charitable discourse uh, apologetic gentleness. Apologetic means how to explain yourself. Apologetics is just a very fancy word for explaining something. Other theologians call it uncommon decency. Uncommon, sad, but true. Or civility. Why do we need to think and talk about this? Because it seems that sometimes, even though we say we love God, when we talk about some things, we forget to look and sound loving. When we wage a cultural war, our neighbors become our enemy. We become adversaries. It becomes more of an us against them type of thing. The wall becomes our friend. Legal protection and First Amendment rights become our strategies. Winning and losing in the present moment becomes the end game. This is not a good focus or goal for people of God's kingdom. One of the disturbing examples we see so prevalent is Christians, Christ followers, believers, talking about their rights. I didn't choose this picture. When Jesus never told us to assert our rights, what did Jesus say? He said crazy things like, go the second mile. They were required by Roman law to walk one mile if a soldier said, carry my stuff. He said, do too. If somebody asked for your, your coat, he would say, give him the rest of your stuff, too. Jesus didn't talk about our rights. He says, what do you do for somebody? Jesus said, love those around you. The kingdom is here. Give it up and give it over. That's my paraphrase. The shrillness of our voices and the stridency with which we argue is harsh enough, but even worse fallout is when God's people are divided. And one of those dividing words is sin. Sin. What's it all about? It's not a popular word. In fact, in fact, it's pretty much not in vogue anymore. We don't like to talk about it. If we do talk about it at all, it's usually about somebody else. <laughs> Point a finger or somewhere else. Jesus did not spend most of his time talking about sin. But when he did, it, it was very clear. Don't do it. The Apostle Paul added a few more details whenever he mentioned sin, and I really don't like what he had to say. He listed untruthfulness in the same breath as murder and adultery. 
he made a pretty hard, hard standard to live by, didn't he? Christ did not suffer because he was evil. He suffered so that others might escape the power of sin. Furthermore, he was resurrected. And he now sits at God's right hand where he reigns over everything. In the same way, the wrongful suffering of Christians can bring people to faith. And Christians can look ahead to the time when God will honor them for their faithfulness. Remember the passage we just read? The suffering brings us into the same family, the same room as Jesus. Please rise to honor the reading of God's word from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since Christ suffered as a human, you all should also arm yourselves with his way of thinking. This is because whoever suffers is finished with sin. As a result, they don't live the rest of their human lives in ways determined by human desires, but in ways determined by God's will. You have wasted enough time doing what unbelievers desire, living in their unrestrained, same flood of unrestrained, oops, I skipped a line, sorry. Living in their unrestrained immorality and lust, their drunkenness and excessive feasting and wild parties and their forbidden worship of idols. They think it's strange that you don't join in these activities with the same flood of unrestrained wickedness. So they slander you. They will have to reckon with the one who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Indeed, this is the reason the good news was also preached to the dead. This happened so that, although they were judged as humans according to human standards, they could live by the Spirit according to divine standards. This is the word of God for people of God. And all God's people said, Thanks. 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 It's a difficult passage. There's a lot to unpack there. But what we're going to focus on is the fact that God is telling us that sin is not the end note. It's not the end of the story. Do you know anyone who has it all together, who never does anything wrong? I want to see the hands. Who are they? I don't either. But I, I do know some folks who think they are all that in a bag of chips. My grandmother used to tell me, I don't sin, I just make mistakes. <laughs> even, I know. Even as a child, that statement confused me. <laughs> I said, being the precocious, read obnoxious child that I was, I tried to explain to her that there was not enough difference between those two words to draw a distinction. I may or may not have been correct on that. When we make a mistake, we tend to think lightly of it, right? I, I just made a goof. Oops. That whatever the mistake was was not, was not all that serious. But if we call it a sin, that carries a lot more emotional weight and baggage, doesn't it? We read in Romans 3.23 that everyone has sinned and everyone falls short of God's glory. You know, we're in, we're in a big club. Nobody gets out. So if we stopped reading there, we could just go home discouraged and not get all of the message. But keep reading into verse 24, Romans 3.24. But all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. Yeah. I kind of missed the white hanky wave because this would be a good time for it right now. So sin. What is the big deal about it? We all have it. Here's the big deal. It makes us realize we need God. And we don't have to live with sin. That's the big deal about sin. The passage from 1 Peter we just read tells us that suffering helps us to be like Christ. Yet people will do anything to avoid pain. I'll testify to that. Followers of Christ, however, should be willing and prepared to do God's will and to suffer for it if necessary. We can overcome sin when we focus on Christ and what he wants us to do. Pain and danger reveal our true values. What do we do when we're in pain? What do we do when we're hurting? Anyone who suffers for doing good and still faithfully obeys in spite of the suffering has made a clean break with sin. 
People whose lives change dramatically at conversion may experience contempt from old friends. We read that in the long passage that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 4. They may be scorned not only because they refuse to participate in certain activities, but also because their priorities have changed. And they're now heading in the opposite direction. Their lives, their changed lives, cause their friends to feel guilty or uncomfortable because they're different now and to feel discriminated against because the new believer's desires have changed. What if, what if, instead of using the word sin, we describe the effects, the before and the after? In other words, we enter into the story of what it means to be caught up in those things that really are sin and how painful and difficult it is to live in that space and why we don't want to live there anymore and that we know why we don't have to live there anymore and we know who can rescue us from that place. What if we use that story, that narrative, instead of using the word sin? For example, social drinking is a thing in our culture. I'm not going to debate the pros and cons of social drinking. But I want to remind you of what I told you in the beginning of this message, how our tribe began as a countercultural safe place for hurting families. Our story is a powerful illustration of how something that's socially acceptable can also damage and destroy some people. We all know families that have been broken by something called social drinking. I'm not saying that's wrong for every family. I'm saying that it is for some of us. But our story also provides a solution for that damage and destruction. You can call him Jesus. And that could be your story too. And what if we admit to ourselves and everyone else that sin is not just about him and you or her or them, but that it's really about me and us. Sin exists. It is real. It is pervasive. But it is not victorious for anyone who calls on the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, yes. It is not victorious for anyone who calls on God. Remembering the title of this message, A Theology of Sin, Humbly Spoken, the key word for us is humble, humbly spoken. Humility is a difficult concept for us. I heard a description of it once. If you think you're humble, you aren't. But that, that does not mean that humility is not a worthy goal because sin affects every one of us. None of us has any right to feel superior or inferior to anyone else. Sin is learning to live and learn. Sin is, excuse me, evidence of something that's broken. Relationship with God leads to relationships with everything else that are in the right place, the right context. We are all affected by sin, but we can all be victorious by aligning our relationship with God. So let us remember that we are each one of us strangers in exile. Exile is a place where God lives with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Let us remember that, beloved, and rejoice that we are part of a large loving family and speak gently of sin and redemption to those around us. Did you hear that? Sin and redemption. No finger pointing unless you're going to share the story of love and lifting up. Steve and I have a guilty pleasure. I'm going to out us right now. We like to watch America's Got Talent every summer. This year, this summer, the winner of America's Got Talent, in case you don't know, it's a, you know, it's like a reality show, but it's, it's engaging. And by the end of the season, we feel like we know all the contestants, you know, like their family. This year, somebody really, really unusual won 
America's Got Talent. Go ahead and put his picture up now. It's a man named Brandon Leake. If you can't read his jacket, it says created to create. He calls himself a spoken word artist. What he is is a rapper or a poet. What he did was, listen to this, what he did was he came out and told his story. And he used words that touched everybody so much that he won over all the other really good, very talented, skilled contestants. What he did was tell the story of his broken life and how Jesus lifted him up. But he used words that the world wasn't used to hearing. And they heard his story and they were inspired. Everybody kept telling how inspired they were by his stories, by what he was telling them. And they didn't know it's because it was God in the middle of the story. The world needs to hear our story. They are hungry for meaning. To hear the truth and the love and the compassion that God holds and the redemption. One of his, his stories was he grew up without a father. And how he was able to forgive his father through the love of Jesus. He used those words. Powerful. The world needs to hear that there's redemption and that there's hope and that there's more than what we see right in front of us. And as I was visiting Wanda Mills this week, there she is. She was lying in bed, not feeling well. In fact, taking pain meds because she's really not feeling well. But you know Wanda, she was smiling. And she said, do you know, Pastor, the thing that I really regret? Is that everybody needs to know. Everybody needs to know Jesus. Amen. We need to tell them. I asked her if I could share that with you. Because I don't tell people stories without asking. But here she is, this sweet, sweet lady who's very ill, and what her concern is that we share, we tell the world that Jesus loves them and that there's more than brokenness. So, beloved, can we set aside our differences and allow God speak to us and through us so that we can share the love that he's given to us with the hurting people in front of us, the people that God puts into our lives, whether we're in school or at work or in the grocery checkout line. People need to know the world is hurting and the word sin is a dividing word, but if we tell how God has changed our lives, we are showing them that there's a different story they can live. Let us pray. Precious Father, you are so big and we are so not. You are so loving and we have so much trouble with that. You are so engaging and we are so dividing. Please help us to be able to tell your story in such a way that people will want more of you, that we can live our lives in such a way that they will want you, that they will say, what is going on with you? What is it? And when we say it's Jesus, they won't turn away and walk off, but will say, yes, please. Make us those people, God. Open us, we pray. In your name, we speak the truth and love, God, and we all say together, amen and amen. <clears throat> this week for the Sunday, go. Be the church, even if we're in exile. Continue to live in love, even during a global pandemic. 
maybe because of the global pandemic. Have you thought about that? It makes people frightened. They need to hear about Jesus. Wherever people are hurting, God moves in, and we can be God's hands and feet. So go. And now prepare to receive the benediction. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for sharing your life with us. We are your people. We are your children. Bless us, we pray.